What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another episode of your Pathfinder 2nd Edition preview content. Today we're covering the blog Learning Takes a Lifetime where we talk about the skills as we'll see them in the Pathfinder playtest. If you guys are liking what you're seeing, remember hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, helps out a lot. Before we dive in, this channel is directly supported through Patreon, and this episode of your Pathfinder 2nd Edition preview content was brought to you in part by Josh King. Josh, thanks so much for your help. Now, let's dive in. So, for some of us, skills represent the right side of the character sheet. Sometimes they get filled out a whole bunch. In the case of the wizard or the bard who has the answers for everything outside of combat, sometimes you have seven intelligence, and you're just trying to do your very best to jam that one rank into perception and maybe stealth, I don't know, just to make sure you can do something outside of combat. Me personally, in Pathfinder 1st Edition, if I can help it, I'll never dump my intelligence below 10, unless maybe if I'm playing like a bard or a rogue, because I want to make sure I have a lot of skill points, or at least as many as I can, if I'm playing something like a fighter or barbarian, to make sure that I have something to do when I'm not cracking someone's brain open with a mallet Gallagher style. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, much like, you know, pretty much the whole game, skills are getting an overhaul as well. Quote, The Pathfinder playtest deals with skills a bit differently than the 1st Edition did. First and foremost, we have cut down the skill list to 17 base skills, down from 35 in Pathfinder 1st Edition. That only tracks with Pathfinder, and I really like that they're doing that. I can't be the only person here today that remembers when Perception was Listen, and Spot, and Search, and Stealth was your ability to hide, but also move silently. It was a huge mess, and of course, granted, you had extra skill ranks to compensate for it back in the day, but still, it was just a jumbled cluster that no one really wanted to deal with. If we're chopping it down even farther, and it looks like we're chopping it down by quite a bit here, I'm totally down for it. Continuing the quote, Much of the reduction came from consolidation. For instance, we put the general functions of use magic device into each of the various knowledge skills that focus on magical traditions, and we wrapped up a bunch of strength-based skills into a general athletics skill. In most cases, we coupled the consolidation with being a tad more generous in the number of skills you can be trained in. For instance, the fighter has three plus intelligence modifier trained skills in the playtest rather than two plus int. So it's a win-win, everybody's happy. Those 17 skills and their key ability scores are as follows. Acrobatics tied to dexterity, arcana tied to intelligence, athletics to strength, crafting to intelligence, deception to charisma, diplomacy and intimidation, also charisma, lore to intelligence, medicine to wisdom, nature, also to wisdom, occultism to intelligence, performance to charisma, religion to wisdom, society to intelligence, stealth to dex, survival to wisdom, and thievery also to dexterity. So right off the back, we can tell that climb and swim have been rolled together into athletics. Thievery appears to be our disabled device meets our sleight of hand. Deception seems to be what we're calling bluff now to fill a more general role, I suppose. Heal is now medicine. And in addition to having lore checks, we have several checks that we're usually used to seeing as knowledge checks like arcana, religion, and nature as their own individual things with lore checks added on. Now let's see if we can figure out what any of this means, shall we? Quote, Like many things in the Pathfinder playtest, skills interact with the proficiency system. While a detailed description of the system can be found earlier in the list of blogs, here's the nitty gritty. Your character can be untrained, trained, an expert, a master, or legendary in a skill. Being untrained grants you a modifier of your level minus two, while being trained grants you a bonus equal to your level, expert, a bonus equal to your level plus one, master a bonus equal to your level plus two, and legendary a bonus equal to your level plus three. Then of course you add your ability modifier in the key ability for that skill and apply any other bonuses or penalties, but the new skill system is more than just the bonuses you gain. Each level of proficiency unlocks skill uses that are either intrinsic to the skill itself or that are uses you select as your character advances, which feels a lot like the Unchained skill unlocks from, you know, Pathfinder Unchained. And now if they're things we can select as well, that's pretty cool. There's a little bit more customization there, which is what we've all come to know and love with Pathfinder First Edition, am I right? I'll say that the proficiency system feels kind of weird for me. 
but that's because I'm a blatant min-maxer and I like making the numbers go super super high. With proficiency instead of skill ranks, one imagines that won't be the same. But of course the meta shifts around that, so all you guys out there just like me, we'll be fine. Don't worry, we're good. Now, let's take a look at how some of these skills work. We're starting with the medicine skill. Specifically, the ability to administer first aid. To manipulate action, you must have healer's tools. You perform first aid on an adjacent creature that is at zero hit points in an attempt to stabilize or revive it. You can also perform first aid on an adjacent creature taking persistent bleed damage. Remember to bring your band-aids. The DC for either is 15. If a creature is both dying and bleeding, choose which one you're trying to end before you roll. You can administer first aid again to attempt to remedy the other. On a success, the creature at zero hit points gains one hit point, or you end the persistent bleed damage. On a critical failure, a creature with zero hit points has its dying condition increased by one. A creature with persistent bleed damage takes damage equal to the amount of its persistent bleed damage. Notice how there's no critical success. Oh, you're at full health. Congratulations, bub. Up you go. It's been said several places in the these videos, both in my own perspective and comments on the videos, that Pathfinder 2nd Edition is going to be a lot more cutthroat, and here we see it. That said, we can actually use the medicine check or the heal check from Pathfinder 1st Edition in combat to actively do a thing for one action. So we pop the heal check, use the healer's tools, they go to one hit point, then we use another action to move, and then lastly our attack action to wonk somebody in the head. The blog also notes if you are trained in the skill, you also gain the ability to use this skill to treat disease and treat poison, which is something someone untrained in the skill can't do. Next up today we're looking at skill feats. Quote, these default uses are just the beginning. As you increase in level, you periodically gain skill feats, usually at even numbered levels. Unless you're a rogue, you get those at every level instead. Skill feats are a subsection of general feats, which means that any character can take them as long as they meet the prerequisites. Moving forward with the example of the medicine skill, as long as you are at least trained in medicine, you can take the battle medic skill feat. This feat allows you to apply straight up healing to an ally through non-magical means, which is nice when your cleric is knocked to the ground or is run out of uses of channel energy or, you know, when everyone's out of resonance at first level and they can't drink potions because they've made their flat checks too much and they're just drinking water that tastes a little funny at this point. There you go. Anywho, I digress. Moving forward. For a higher level example, Robust Recovery is a medicine skill feat that you can take after becoming an expert in that skill and increases the bonus to saving throws against poison and disease when you treat creatures with those trained skill uses. When you become legendary in medicine, you gain the skill feat Legendary Medic. It's a general skill feat, level 15, requires you, again, to be legendary in medicine. You've invented new medical procedures or discovered ancient techniques. Once per day for each target, you can spend one hour treating the target and attempt a medicine check to remove a disease or the blinded, deafened, drained, or enervated condition. Use the DC of the disease or of the speller effect that created the condition. If the effect source is an artifact, a creature above 20th level, or other similarly powerful source, increase the DC by 5. So yeah, this is your basic super awesome restoration spells for the people without magic. The rogues can take this, the fighters can take this, the barbarians can put down their great swords for like an hour, please and hold some pressure on some wounds to stop the bleeding and we can help people. And that's a really important balancing thing in a world, again, where resonance will exist and potions won't be the end all be all that they were in Pathfinder First Edition. I've also said as we've gone through these blogs and these discussions that it feels like a successful party in Pathfinder Second Edition is more of the classic tank, healer, and high damaging classes this helps mitigate that. If the fighter can take heal and eventually get to legendary medic somehow, we don't necessarily have to have a cleric in the party or an alchemist or someone to fill that spot. We can still have that everyone takes care of their own problems mentality that I really enjoy. Before we round off today, we're looking at stealth, quote. Stealth is a bit of an outlier in that all of its initial uses can be attempted untrained but training and later proficiency in the skill yields some very subversive results. The Quiet Allies skill feat allows you to use your expertise in stealth to reduce those pesky armor check penalties on allies' skill checks. Hey, in a planar crossroads, this looks really good for the way you guys run your group stealths with 
Magpie's stealth with Gideon's armor check penalty. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, and Adam does, he can hear me, follow this card right up here to be directed to those guys' Rise of the Rune Lords playlist. It's super fun, and hey, again, if you haven't heard, yours truly does show up around episode 30 on this pretty boy right here, an orc hunter and his war cat. But to continue, Swift Sneak allows a master in stealth to move at their full speed when they sneak upon becoming legendary. You further enhance your skill by no longer needing to specifically declare the sneaking exploration tactic when you are in exploration mode, allowing you to sneak everywhere. So yeah, that's really good for the lazy player or the player who likes to play with his phone and oh yeah, yeah, I'm sneaking. I'm, I am the rogue today. I am doing the sneaking. Look at me. Ha ha. Now it's just a thing. It's literally just part of who you are. One final quote before we go. Much like how ancestry feats allow you to choose the type of human, dwarf, elf, or whatever you want to play, the proficiency and skill feat system will enable you to determine what kind of knowledgeable, athletic, or sneaky character you want to play. Over time, the system gives us the opportunity to add more skill uses by way of skill feats, which will allow the game to become more dynamic as we add options. This also allows you to continue to grow your skills in new and surprising ways, without us having to pull out the wires of the underlying skill. That's really cool. That's definitely, especially in a world where retraining is a thing when Ultimate Sneaky Guy comes out in 2021 and we all get our hands on it and we see there's a million different skill feats for our rogues. We can just quickly retrain into them. We've got them all right there. We have the skill-oriented skill monkey built exactly the way we want to build them. But what do you guys think of all this? Are you excited that we're moving to proficiencies in Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Are you excited that the skills are being even more condensed in Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Or should we break out, you know, spot, search, and listen all over again? Most of all, if we're still stoked out there for Pathfinder 2nd Edition like I know I am, don't forget we're playing Doomsday Dawn right here on the channel. Six lucky subscribers will run through that adventure. The first ever published bit of content for second edition and you've got just under one month to enter the giveaway for more information follow this card right up here remember that patronage at any tier grants you a second entry in all of our giveaways and if we can get patronage up to about 300 bucks a month we'll take two groups through anyway thank you guys so much for watching again be sure to like and subscribe for more content the next episode of your pathfinder second edition preview content drops this Saturday.